me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I, was, uh, I was born April 21st, 1968 uh, in Burien. More importantly, I was born again September 24th, 1982 on Whidbey Island. I was 14 years old and I made the shift from death to life. I was a freshman in high school and I had never read the Bible before. I knew almost nothing about it. Uh, I was raised in a good home. My parents are here today, so I have to say that I think. So <laughs> I was raised in a really good home, not a Christian home, uh, but it was, a, it was a good place. I grew up uh, in, in just a really good environment. So thanks, Mom and Dad. Uh, <clears throat> I have been, uh, I've been working at Boeing for about uh, 30 years or so, almost 30 years, uh, making airplanes. And uh, I was talking to my boss last week, and I said, you know, I'm coming up on my 30-year anniversary. And he's like, oh, 30 years, you think you'd be better by now. So I was like, hey, thanks, boss. I may be slow, uh, but I do poor work. So anyways, um, <clears throat> I'm married to Geneva, my wife, uh, 14 years. And, uh, you know, Driscoll used to say, you know, you probably don't want my marriage, and I probably don't want yours. Um, but you guys might want my marriage. It's, it's pretty good. I've really enjoyed it. We've had high highs and a couple of lows here and there, uh, but it's been good. So um, before I went on at 9 o'clock, I got a text from my wife, and she said, just go up there and be yourself. And then she wrote, eh, maybe not. So anyway, so that's, that's our relationship. Um, I love, I love humor, I love to laugh, and so uh, it is with some irony that today uh, we'll be preaching out of the imprecatory psalm, uh, 69. It's a psalm of cursing, and unfortunately, this is where the humor ends today, because there is not a lot of laughs in the passage that we're going to look at. Uh, let me do this. Let's pray, and then we'll, we'll get in. I'll share a story with you. Father, we ask that you would be here today, that my words would be your words, that your spirit would move, and that your son would be exalted because he is worth it. And we are grateful for him, and we are thankful for the gift that you have given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1994, I was laid off from Boeing for a couple of years, and I took my family, wife, three kids, down to Portland, Oregon, where I began um, studying Bible and theology at Multnomah University. Uh, my kids were three and a half, two and a half, and I think eight months old. And so we headed down to Portland, finished the first semester, and during that summer, I found out that my wife had the first of what would be several affairs our marriage would end as a result of that. It was a time of, of grief. I, I remember one time I was sitting in my parents' living room on the couch and, and I felt like my mind was slipping away. It was, the, it was the most bizarre feeling that I've ever had. And it was, it was a grief like I've never experienced. Now, I had been a Christian for a while, and, and so the question is, how do you handle that? Because that was not part of the plan. We were to go to Oregon, finish a degree, and perhaps pursue ministry. And unfortunately, those plans were curtailed, and the marriage eventually ended. And it was a very, very difficult time. I, I remember sitting there, and I felt like I felt like I was drowning in sadness. I, I tend not to be a super emotional person, but that was a, a time of emotional roller coaster like I had never experienced. Um, and there weren't a lot of high highs. It was mostly just a lot of very low lows. And it was tough. And we spent a couple of years trying to work through it. And it was the most trying time for me spiritually, emotionally, and, and in every way. It was tough. 
have, have you ever felt that way? Have you ever been wronged and you're crying out to God? Right, open your Bibles to Psalm 69. A couple of passages. Psalm 69, one. David cries out, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the floods have swept over me. Verse 14, deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. In Romans chapter eight, it talks about groanings that are too deep for words. And I remember often sitting there and just, just groaning. I, I didn't know what to say. I, I, there, was no, there were no words. It was just pain. And I just groaned, and that happened a lot. David was a warrior, but he was also a poet. And the things that he wrote were things that I could identify with. Save me, help me. Yeah, I, I felt like I was drowning. And the imagery that he shows here is, is one of drowning. Now, I've obviously never drowned before. And yet it felt like what I thought drowning would be. I felt like I was drowning and it seemed like David understood that. And it seemed like I could identify with him, unfortunately. Yeah, like I said, I, I try not to be overly emotional but the Psalms are all about feeling. You know, for a guy like me, I want to read a book. I want to have a passage and a text. And it's deep emotion in the Psalms. You know, Pastor Daniel preached on lament a few weeks ago. Deep grief. And Pastor Joel got to preach on thanksgiving and, and praise. And those are great. The Psalms are, there are 150 of them. Now it's said if you were to categorize the Psalms, you'd come up with about 150 different categories because they're all a little bit different. But what we see are patterns that develop and Psalm 69 has a couple of types of Psalm. The first one is lament. The first half is David crying out to God. And lament is a deep-seated grief. The second one is imprecation, the imprecatory psalms. It means to call down curses upon someone, to call down curses upon someone. And as you read David, it seems like his grief turns to anger, and then his anger turns to vengeance. And I identify with that unfortunately, because my grief eventually turned to anger and my anger eventually turned to vengeance. Now, I never did anything physically. I never harmed anybody. But in my heart, there was a lot of horrible things going on. I never committed a crime, but it was all on the inside. And the fact of the matter is, walking with Jesus is all about what's in the heart, because what's in the heart eventually makes its way out. And I experienced a little bit of that. See, after the first affair, I experienced a lot of grief, and we tried to work it out. I found out about the second and third at about the same time, and everything blew up. The marriage ended, the family was divided, I got to learn a lot about divorce court and child custody issues, and it was a horrifying time because I, I just, it didn't make sense. I, I had been a Christian for a long time, 
why am I going through this? And it hurt. And it seemed like horrible injustice was being done. Now, let's talk about injustice for just a minute. Not necessarily injustice against us, but injustice in general. Uh, when we were talking through preaching through the summer, uh, it was uh, a few weeks prior, there was the shooting in Orlando. Now, 49 people were murdered for no reason. And I thought, just for a moment, well, maybe I'll have to use that as an illustration about injustice and horrible evil. Uh, but unfortunately, between then and now, there have been all kinds of stories about injustice and evil. And nice, France, the officers in Dallas, uh, Munich, just a couple of days ago. Uh, the world is broken, and there is injustice everywhere. Uh, I was talking to Pastor Bubba once, and he was sharing a story about when he was invited to preach at a funeral. Now, the mom was a believer. Her son was about 50 years old, and he was murdered. Mama was a believer. Lots of the family were not. Many of the family and friends were not believers. They were pagans. They were atheists. They were God-haters. And all of those folks were in one room. And Pastor Bubba is like, what do I say? And here's, here's what he said, and I, I think it's poignant. He stood up, he said, murder is a terrible evil and justice must prevail. That murder is a terrible evil and justice must prevail. Now, in a room with that kind of diversity, you probably could not get agreement on much of anything. And yet on that point, they all agreed. Murder is a terrible evil and justice must prevail. And I think it has something to do with this. Uh, if you're familiar with the term, the imago Dei, it's a Latin term, it means the image of God. Every human being is created in the image and likeness of God, according to Genesis. And so, with that, sometimes you have family traits, right? Family traits, some people in the family all kind of look alike. Well, God created us, and, and God is loving. So we're, we're capable of love. God is creative, and we're capable of creativity. And God abhors evil and injustice, and so do we. Down deep, we know that murder is a terrible evil, and justice must prevail. We see injustice, and there's something inside of us that says no. We've seen a lot of injustice in our world just in the last week. And there's something inside of us that says no, that's evil, and that evil needs to be punished. But the fact is, a desire for justice is good, and it is godly. A desire for justice is good, and it is godly. Because evil must be punished. Justice must prevail. The books have to be balanced. And the scores need to be settled. And there's something in us that knows that that is right and that that is good. So our topic over this last summer has been praying through the Psalms. How do you pray through a psalm of cursing. What does that look like? So again, let's look at Psalm 69. Let's look at verse 22. Verse 22. Now this is David talking. Let their own table before them become a snare, and when they are at peace, let it become a trap. You know, growing up, uh, we, we always had dinner around the dinner table, and it was my sister and I and, and our folks, and it, it was always peaceful. You know, we could kind of be ourselves there. And David's saying, I don't want that for them. I want their table to be a snare. I want it, when they're at peace, I want it to be a trap. And that seems harsh. 
Verse 23, let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and make their loins tremble continually. Yeah, you know, you probably have seen a person who is blind. You know, they have the white cane and they're walking around. And, and I always think to myself, that's amazing that they get around being blind. I mean, I could barely get around my bedroom when it's half lit without stubbing my toe. And these folks are just like getting around town. I don't even know how they do that. And I would not wish blindness on anybody. And yet, we see verse 23. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see. Verse 24. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. Now remember, this is the God who swept the world in Genesis 6 with a flood. The same God that poured fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah and took the firstborn of Egypt. And David's saying, I want to see that to them. And that seems harsh. Verse 25, may their camp be a desolation and let no one dwell in their tents. It seems like he's going after the family now. It's not enough for justice for them. I want their whole line taken care of. I want their tents to be empty. I want the children to be fatherless and the fathers to be childless. And that seems pretty harsh. Verse 27. Add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no acquittal from you. Punish them. When they're in court, they're guilty. They deserve it. They have it coming. Go get them. And that seems harsh. Verse 28. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. And now it's taken a turn. It's not just judgment here and now, but he's talking about the hereafter. And he's talking about separation from God. Do we ever wish hell on somebody? Because that's what it is. And that seems really harsh. Because he's talking about punishment here and the punishment hereafter. He's wishing eternal destruction on people. Do we pray like that? Are we supposed to pray like that? David's grief turned to anger and his anger turned to vengeance. And so did mine. That was going on in my heart. And I knew it was wrong. And yet, that's what was going on in my heart. Let's talk about anger for a minute. Do, do we have a right to be anger? Do we have a right to be angry? Is anger a sin? Ephesians chapter 4 says, in your anger, do not sin. So they're not necessarily the same thing. And you go, oh, great, I can be angry. And then James comes along in chapter 1 and says, he says this, He said, uh, be slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Be slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Can we be angry and not sin? Eh, maybe. But our anger does not bring about the righteousness of God. It just doesn't. I can be angry all day long and it's not bringing around God's righteousness. Probably what it's doing is just destroying me. Are you, are you angry? Have you struggled with this? It, 
it breaks you up. So, how do we process this? Now, I'll give you a, a, a couple of points. Things that were helpful to get me from the place where I was to the place where I needed to be. So number one, pray honestly. And it sounds kind of trite. It's like, hey, dude, just pray, man. Um, it's not just that. In Psalm 139, David said, search me, O Lord. Find out if there's any grievous way in me. And I had to do some of that praying and find out what's going on in my heart. I didn't commit any crimes. I, I didn't curse with my mouth, but in my heart, that's a different story. Was there any grievous way in me at that time? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's okay in your honest prayer to let God know what you think, to be honest with him. It's like, can I pray and be honest to God? Yeah, you can. Because God loves you right where you're at. But here's the point. He loves you too much to leave you there. Because in your anger, sometimes anger just turns into bitterness. God loves you where you're at, but he's not going to leave you there. He will take you through it, praying honestly. Uh, one of the most honest prayers I've ever seen in the Bible uh, comes out of Mark chapter 9. There was a father who had a son who was possessed, and it was horrible, and he brought his son to Jesus. He said, can you heal him? And Jesus said, do you believe? And the father cries out, I believe, but help my unbelief. And that's honest. Because there are times in our life, and it's oftentimes it's most of the time, where we can't even pray properly. We can't even repent properly. We, we just cry out to God, say, I believe, but there's still a part of me that doesn't. And God will meet you there. And, and Jesus did heal the man. He, he healed the man's son. He just prayed honestly. Secondly, community. Now we have, uh, Pastor Tim talked about community groups. Uh, it's not just a time to get together and know people. It's, a, it's being surrounded by brothers and sisters who can uphold you if you're in a tough place. Now I had great parents. Um, they were there for me. My sister was there for me. And I had other Christian friends who were there for me, pastors who would listen to me rant for hours. And they were very gracious toward me. And they loved me where I was. But they also encouraged me when I started to get from the anger to the bitterness and I wasn't processing it, they encouraged me to repent. And that's tough. I have a right to be angry, don't I? But I don't have the right to stay there. And Christian community, authentic, real people who will love you, who will pray with you, who will pray for you. It's important. If you're not involved in Christian community, other brothers and sisters, you're missing out. You're missing out on the, from hearing from the Lord through other people. And so I would absolutely encourage you, get involved in a community group. Um, because it's not just enough to do it when you're hurting. Get to know some folks. Um, there are three types of people. Those who are in the storm, those who are coming out of the storm, and those who are getting ready to go into it. So wherever you're at, get in Christian community and live life with your brothers and sisters and encourage them. Lastly, time in the Word, the Bible. Uh, it's, again, it sounds trite. Just read your Bible, man. Uh, it's more. Jesus is found in there. We, pre we talk to God through prayer. And he speaks to us through his word. That's how it happens. 
If you want to hear about Jesus, if you want to learn about Jesus, it's in the Bible. And I know it sounds kind of trite, but it's true. Spending time in the Word, spending time with the Lord in the Word, seeing Jesus, it will change you. So those three things, pray honestly, vital community, and spend time in the Word. So speaking of the Scripture, let's look at 69, verse 21. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. Does, uh, does that sound familiar to anybody? Here's what we find. In all four of the Gospels, this verse is cited. When Jesus is on the cross, the soldiers offer him sour wine. And it's curious, why did all four of the authors point to this text? Because not all of them had the same perspective on Jesus' life. Matthew was different than Mark, and Mark different than Luke, and Luke different than John. They each had a different uh, perspective of the life of Jesus, and yet all of them found a way to put this in here. And here's what I would suggest, that it is the apostles' way to direct us to kind of how David's actions are compared and contrasts with Jesus. Because when David got sour wine, what did he do? Well, verse 21, he started cursing. Curse, curse, curse. What did Jesus do when he was offered sour wine? He said, Father, forgive them. While he was being murdered, he was forgiving. When David was experiencing his situation, he was cursing. And I think by way of comparison, we can go, I have two choices here. Do what David did, or do what Jesus did. David cursed, and Jesus blessed. It's a model for our response. And to be honest, it's an impossible response outside of God working in you. This is not able to happen unless God is working in you and through you. That you would forgive while you are being murdered. You're never more like Jesus than when you're forgiving others. You're never more like Jesus than when you are forgiving others because that's who he is, that's what he does. Jesus forgives. David cursed and Jesus forgave. And I tend to be more like David. And I don't wanna be. I wanna be a little more like Jesus. How did, I, how did I respond? In the situation I was in, I want mercy. I want grace. They deserve judgment. They deserve vengeance. It's pretty quick that the hypocrisy comes right to the top. I am saying one thing and doing another. I follow Jesus, but I will not live as he has called me to live. I don't do what he does. I want mercy. They get judgment. In Matthew 18, there's a story about a, a man who is owed a great debt. And the person that he owes says, I forgive your debt. So how do you respond to that kind of graciousness? Well, that man went out and started to collect all the other debts of all the other people who owed him. And unfortunately, there are times when I look more like that guy. How should we respond? I've been forgiven much, so I should forgive. 
But sometimes I find myself a little more like that guy. And I don't like what I see there. Extending forgiveness doesn't excuse or minimize the wrong done. It simply puts the responsibility of punishment in the hands of God where it belongs. Extending forgiveness does not excuse or minimize the wrong. And if you're sitting here and you're thinking, what about the wrong that's been done against me? The price will be paid for that wrong. The price will be paid for that sin against you. But who does it? That's the question. Do I get to do it? The Bible says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. He's the only one who gets to do vengeance. Not us. Just him. Because remember, justice is good and it's godly. And God will balance the books someday. The scores will be settled someday. Vengeance will happen in one of two places. It will happen on Jesus on the cross in our place for our sin or to the enemies of God. It will happen ultimately in hell. At Resurrection Church, we want to be known as a place where the good news is told. But the fact is, with the good news, there's often some bad news. And the bad news is, we are separated from God by our sin. And we are on our way to eternal punishment away from the presence of God. That's bad news. But here's the good news. In Romans 3, it says that God has caused his full judgment to come upon his son. The word used is propitiation, a complete satisfaction of the wrath and vengeance of God did not come down on me, it did not come down on you, it came down on Jesus. It came down on his son. That is good news for us. Now, I'm a dad, I've got three kids, I've got two stepkids. And I love my kids. And I love you guys. But I don't know that I would sacrifice my son for you. I don't know that I love you that much. I'm sorry that's hard to hear. I assume the same from you. And yet God sacrificed his one and only son to pay the price that we should pay. That Isaiah 53 says it was the Lord's will to crush him, to cause him to suffer. That this is the way God has ordained that vengeance happen. It happens on his son or for his enemies, it happens someday. There's a messianic passage out of Isaiah 63, and it says that Jesus is coming through. It says that the Lord is coming through, and there is blood on his robes. But it's not his blood. Because Jesus, the first time he came, was to take vengeance on himself. He carried vengeance on himself. But there will come a time, someday in the future, where he will execute judgment. That is bad news if you are an enemy of God. But Ephesians says, while I was a sinner, Christ died for me. That's good news. Is that your story? Do you long for the good news or are you awaiting the bad news? Jesus died and he was raised from the dead. We 
have named our church Resurrection Church. It's emblazoned in big foot-long letters on the side. Jesus died, he rose again, and he lives. So how do we respond? I'd like to invite the band up. For the Christian, let's look at verse 30. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. We respond by praising him. Sing loud. The person next to you might not like it, but God loves your voice. Praise God, because the price that we owe has been paid. How do we respond? In thankfulness. In a moment, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. We are going to remember that the price paid was a body broken, was blood shed. It's a sober reminder that our salvation came at a high price because there ain't nothing free. Jesus died in our place for our sin. If you are here and have not responded to Jesus, I would invite you to repent, to change a mind, change of a heart that makes itself out to a changed life. And we would invite you to cling to Jesus. Because of Jesus, we can trust that God will make all things right, especially our relationship with him. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful that today we can hear from you. We are grateful for the gift of your son and the cost and the high price that he paid for me. I ask that you would stir in us a reminder that our freedom was not free. The price paid was very high. And we thank you for that. We praise your son. We exalt him. And we exalt you in his name. Amen.